Okay, so throughout this class, you've been exposed to lots of cool analytical techniques. Um, you can do really cool analyses with R, you can download data sets from the internet, you can start doing stuff with them. Um, you'll eventually get jobs working for organizations that will be awash in data, and your job is to do stuff with that data. You have the skills to do that, and that's really cool. Um, you have really powerful tools to do this. R is an incredibly valuable skill for this type of stuff. Causal inference specifically is a very valuable skill. Um, organizations are very, very interested in the causes of things. Um, even like political campaigns, they will um, do all sorts of randomized control trials. They call them A-B tests, but it's the same idea um, where they will put different users in an A group and a B group, and they'll manipulate one thing in between those groups to see which is more effective. So often a political campaign will change the color of its donate button in an email and give the A group one color and the B group one color and they'll see which one gives more donations um, and then they'll stick with whichever group wins. Um, and so that is a causal question. It seems super simple, but organizations are very, very interested in the causes of things. And you have skills now to be able to find those causes and isolate those causes. Um, and all of these tools can be used to improve the world, and that's great. Um, that's why lots of you are getting Masters of Public Policy and Public Administration. You're interested in social policy. You're interested in the nonprofit sector, in using the power of the public sector to fix and improve the world. That's why you're here. You have tools to do that now. But at the same time, you can use these tools to harm the world, um, either advertently or inadvertently. Um, and so there are specific pitfalls that you can fall into as you're doing this type of data analysis. And so in this section, I want to kind of talk about these, these general pitfalls and how to avoid them and how to avoid kind of destroying the world with data. Um, so the, the three general categories we're going to talk about really quick here are this idea of manipulation. You don't want to coerce people into doing things they don't want to do necessarily. Um, we'll talk about bias. Um, and this is really important. This goes to this notion that there is no such thing as objective data or models. And this is controversial to lots of people. Um, there are lots of people who work with data who think that they're working with data because it's better than interviewing people because interviewers have bias. Data is just raw numbers. There's no bias in the data. And so it is purely objective. And while it is true that like there's no like racism in regression results, um, there is racism in the numbers that are behind regression results. Um, there are all sorts of hidden biases built into the data that you use, um, and your analyses can perpetuate that. So we'll talk about bias issues. And then we'll talk about this final um, pitfall here called accidental evil, where sometimes your own stupidity um, or incompetence as, an, uh, as a data analyst um, or if, if you just don't think about specific situations, it can lead to bad outcomes. They can lead to all sorts of um, negative consequences. And so that's what we're going to be concerned about is um, this accidental evil idea. So with manipulation, um, this is where we don't want to coerce people into doing things that they don't necessarily want to do or changing behavior in bad ways. So to introduce this idea, um, we need, to talk about, we need to talk about a fun TV show here called The Good Place, um, which you should all watch. It's on Netflix now, all four seasons. Um, it's hilarious. It's written by the same guy who wrote um, The Office and Parks and Rec um, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So that kind of comedy here. But the premise in The Good Place here is that it is about the afterlife, um, that people on Earth die, and then they go to um, either The Good Place or The Bad Place. Um, based on a whole point system. So right here, in the very first episode of The Good Place, they outline the point system, where if you do specific things during your life, you gain positive points and you gain negative points, or lose points. Um, and so based on your total point value when you die, if it's above some threshold, then you get to go to The Good Place. If it's below some threshold, you go to The Bad Place. It's a good regression discontinuity. Um, and so you can see kind of different reasons for getting points. You end slavery, you get 814,000 points. Tell a woman to smile, lose 53 points, etc. cetera. Um, there's all sorts of great things in here. It's, it's a fun show. Um, and so basically the whole thing is focused on this point system and the ethics of, of, of living your life to um, basically collect points. 
And one of the main plot points is that nobody on Earth knows about this point system because if you did, it would ruin the whole um, reason for being good. Um, and so kind of the ethical reason for being good right now on Earth is because you're supposed to be good um, and supposed to be nice to your neighbors and nice to others. Um, you're not doing it to earn specific points. If you know about the point system, that will distort your behavior. So you don't want to necessarily know about this point system. In the real world, here on Earth, we do have point systems um, that do shape our behavior in strange ways. Um, so in China specifically, they have something called the social score um, that is based on people's interactions with their neighbors and with government officials and with store owners and with whoever. Um, and your social score is built on a whole bunch of different factors, um, including like closed caption TV, um, credit score records, um, on time payment of rent, a whole bunch of things that all just kind of collapse into a number that you have. And that number then determines um, kind of your privileges and, and benefits that you can get in society. And um, your, um, so it's, it's kind of like a good place system, um, but applied to real life. And it's not just China that does this. We in the United States have a similar system. We don't call it a social score. We call it a credit score. Um, it's not based on like um, individual actions. Like if you're caught on closed caption TV doing something bad, that doesn't hurt your credit score. But if you have a late payment or if you um, make too many requests for credit or something, you, there's all this weird arcane stuff that you can do that ruins your, your credit score. And then that messes up future opportunities or provides more future opportunities. So it's not just China that does this. Everybody has some sort of number system. China is just kind of at the extreme because it's applied to everyday actions and it can go wrong. Um, a couple years ago in 2018, um, there was this, uh, a city in China that was testing this experiment of social sanctions um, where if you were caught jaywalking through closed captioning TV, it would put a picture of you on a giant billboard in the downtown part of the city to basically shame you and say, look at this person, they just jaywalked and you lose points in your social score. Um, and so people didn't want to jaywalk because they didn't want their face up on, on the billboard and they didn't want the, the punishment associated with that. What ended up happening though was a politician in the city had her face on a city bus um, and the city bus went over a crosswalk. And so that's what you see here. Um, and then her face was plastered all over the giant billboard because she jaywalked. She didn't actually jaywalk. It was her face that jaywalked on the bus. Um, but that was enough to um, trigger social shaming and got her up on the giant board. Um, so yeah, that's like bad. Um, that she wasn't actually punished because of this. Um, but it does it is kind of a, a sign of potential dystopian use of this of this scoring system of of quantifying every behavior. Um, quantifying things also shapes your experience in um, in social media. You're probably all aware of this now, hopefully, um, just because Facebook has been getting bad at this. Um, if you've noticed when you look at Facebook or Instagram or Twitter even, um, the feed that you have is not chronological. If one of your friends posts something, you will not see it immediately. Um, all of those feeds are built or are, are presented through algorithms where the algorithm decides what things you want to see first um, based on a whole bunch of different criteria. Facebook's algorithm is very opaque. Um, Twitter's algorithm is very opaque. Everybody's is really opaque. They're not really telling us why things appear or why they don't appear. Um, a few years ago, Instagram accidentally published um, some of its feed ranking criteria um, where they show, um, they show you stuff on Instagram based on your predicted interest in a post, um, how recently it was posted, and the relationship with the person. Um, these are basically coefficients in a regression model, and they're predicting if you're going to interact with the post based on interest, recency, and relationship. And so if you interact with the post, then that reinforces the algorithm and then they'll show you more interesting or recent or closely related people. Um, you'll see this on Facebook. If you start liking people's things, like a friend that you haven't talked to in a couple of years, you'll start seeing more and more of their stuff on your feed because the Facebook alg algorithm says, oh, they're interested in that. Let me show them some more stuff. 
which seems fairly innocuous, but it can lead to all sorts of issues. Um, a few years ago, the Wall Street Journal had this um, reporting project called Blue Feed, Red Feed, um, where they looked at a kind of a prototypical um, liberal Facebook feed and a prototypical conservative Facebook feed to see what kind of news stories they were seeing um, about what was going on with current events. Um, so this is no longer being updated. If you if you press the P button, if you're using the HTML version of the slides, you can actually click on a link and see the, the real live version of this blue feed, red feed thing. Um, this is essentially what it looks like. Um, this is from 2019, so it's not current. Um, but it shows like the stories that liberals get versus the stories that conservatives get on their feeds um, are wildly different. And so people are getting completely different um, versions of reality, essentially, um, through their Facebook feeds. Um, the same thing happens with Twitter. The same thing happens with Instagram. Um, basically, any algorithmic feed is determined by your interactions with it. Um, you can mess this up. Um, there was this, this author for Wired a couple years ago um, decided to just click on like on every single post they saw. Um, and that basically broke his algorithm um, where Facebook didn't know what to show him anymore. They didn't know which friends should be shown first, um, how recently um, different posts should be shown. He just clicked on everything, every ad, every news post, every meme, every everything. And basically, the algorithm just started feeding him junk. It didn't know what kind of news stories he was interested in. It showed him stuff from super obscure friends um, because it didn't know who his friends were anymore. It, it destroyed the algorithm internally for him. Um, so you can fight against the algorithms by doing this. That would be fun. Um, some other things that can happen because of all of this data and all of this information that these companies have on you is this notion here where you've probably all had this happen to you and you've joked around like saying, maybe Facebook is spying on me. I was just talking about a specific type of beef jerky yesterday and then I got an ad for it on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, maybe they have their microphone turned on in my phone and they are hearing me and picking it up. Um, you probably all run into situations like that. There's this podcast here. If you click on, or if you press P again, um, the link to this podcast is in the, the presenter notes here. Um, it's a really fascinating podcast because um, the hosts interview people at Facebook and discover that they're not actually doing that. Um, they don't need to. They don't need to listen to your conversations um, to figure out what to suggest for you. They have so much information about everybody in the entire world um, based on location and time of posting and a whole bunch of other stuff that they can piece things together. So one of the stories in this podcast is that one person went to a party, met somebody, um, and then met an acquaintance of this person and was just kind of briefly introduced and then left the party. And then that night, um, Instagram recommended that they follow that acquaintance of this new friend. Um, and the person was freaked out because they were just in that same room. That was the very first time they'd ever met. And maybe they were spying. They weren't spying um, through voice. They were spying because they knew the exact location of the person and of the acquaintance and of all of those people at the party. And so it pieced it together and said, you were near this person. You probably talked to them. You should be their friend, um, which feels still super dystopian, even if they're not spying on you vocally. Um, but you can do this. And then that starts getting into manipulation land. Um, because then they can start suggesting things to you um, to try to change your behavior. Facebook got in trouble for this a few years ago. Um, they were working with some social, social scientists to see if Facebook feeds could cause depression. Um, and so what they did is they ran an experiment and gave some people sad feeds and some people happy feeds. Um, it was still the same like friends posting things. It's just that the algorithm decided or they had the algorithm put sadder posts up first um, and put happier posts up first for the, the treatment or the control group to see if, if, if they would be happier. Um, and they found that indeed Facebook can make you depressed depending on what appears in the algorithm, um, which feels really manipulative. Um, there were also fears in 2016 and in 2020 that you could do the same thing basically for voter registration. Um, you could encourage some voters to register and not encourage other voters to register and basically control who's registering to vote. 
um, and influence an election that way. Um, and so there were worries about that. They published papers saying we're not doing that. Here's our transparency practices for that. But there is a potential for that kind of manipulation given all of this data that they have, which is a worry. Um, it can lead to other weird issues. Um, Target a few years ago got in trouble because they sent a letter or they sent an advertisement to um, some teenage girl congratulating her on her new baby and gave her a whole bunch of coupons for uh, for baby products. Um, and the girl's dad discovered that um, and got really mad at Target and called Target up and said, why are you sending us these ads? That's imp It's weird. That's impossible. She can't be pregnant. Um, but it turns out she was pregnant. Um, the algorithm just picked it up because of her recent purchases at Target. Um, and so your purchases at any grocery store or Target or Costco or anywhere, um, they can also piece those together and guess what you're going to do. And so from this article here, they basically say this one fictional person here, if they bought a cocoa butter lotion and a large purse and some supplements, then there's an 87% chance that that person is pregnant with a due date um, at some point later, like they can actually figure out your due date and start sending you coupons for um, having a baby, which again, feels really dystopian and manipulative. Um, other agencies or other organizations do this too. Um, airlines um, a couple years ago got into this thing where they would algorithmically split up families um, based on their predicted willingness to pay to sit together. So if you bought a ticket with your spouse and then um, for whatever reason, um, United or American decided to split you up and put you in different seats, they did that because they figured that you would pay extra to be reseated together. Um, if the algorithm said they're most likely not going to pay to be reseated, then the algorithm would keep you together. So if it guessed that you were rich enough to pay to be reseated, it would force you to reseat yourselves, which feels wrong and it is wrong. They got in trouble for it. Um, but again, you're using data to manipulate people, which you don't want to do. But not all of this is dystopian. Um, so in 2015, um, President Obama, when he was working with um, the chief data scientist of the United States, we talked about in the very first session, DJ Patil. Um, one of their initiatives was this idea of precision me medicine, where you could basically map somebody's genetic code and match them with proper medicines that were personalized to them, basically using these, these fancy algorithms that Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram are developing, but applying that to medicine. And that is an effective way of, of kind of tailoring personalized medical attention to people. Um, and so they were pursuing that. Um, after the Obama administration ended, DJ Patil went on um, to work with a startup here. Um, this is a nonprofit called the Crisis Text Line, where if you text um, 741741, um, it's basically an automated bot that helps you with um, mental health issues. It's a suicide prevention um, texting line. And what they do is they use all of the conversations that they're getting um, from the texts to build an algorithm that predicts if people are going to become suicidal or show other um, self-harming tendencies. And what they find, oddly enough, with their algorithm here, let me move myself out of the way, is that like if a texter messages with the word ibuprofen, they're six times, 16 times more likely to be actively suicidal. Um, and then, so if you're texting with this bot and you mention ibuprofen, for whatever reason, the algorithm says that requires human intervention, and then they switch from the bot to a human, and then they start helping the person um, more directly. But that's only because of algorithms that say that's, what's, that's what happens, because the person mentioned ibuprofen or bridge or tonight or other specific words. Um, so that's, that's cool. That's being used to, to help people. Um, but it poses this interesting question. And if we were in person, we would have this fun debate about this, but we're not in person. So um, debate this amongst yourself. Um, what makes this whole social score, like in China, um, and the crisis score, where if you say the word ibuprofen, then a person is going to get on the line and start talking to you, what makes them ethically different? They're still, they're picking up all sorts of weird um, social cues and pieces of data that you leave around just by existing. Um, and then they're doing something with it and trying to 
essentially, not necessarily manipulate in the case of the crisis score, but intervene on your behalf. Um, and so what I would argue is they're, they're not, fundamentally, they're kind of the same thing, um, picking up pieces of information, doing stuff with it. But on an ethical level, they're not quite the same thing because one, um, they both manipulate situations, but one is designed to help people specifically. Um, the other one is designed to kind of create a social order. Um, if you jaywalk, you get your face plastered all over a screen. If you mention ibuprofen, you don't get your face plastered all over a screen that says this person is a, is a risk for mental health issues. That doesn't happen. Um, so I guess kind of at an ethical level, it's, it's the idea that the crisis score is kind of respecting people as people. Um, and it's not manipulating them overtly. And so that's generally the guidelines to think about as you're doing any sort of data analysis and trying to predict what people are doing. You are making predictions when you're doing um, any of this uh, causal inference stuff. When you do inverse probability weighting, you're calculating propensity scores. Um, so you're basically saying, here's this magic formula that predicts if people are going to use the program. Um, maybe mentioning ibuprofen will make them use the program more. That could be a confounder. Who knows? Um, but you need to focus on kind of remembering that people are people and they're individuals. So think about autonomy. Think about people. Um, don't rely 100% on data. Um, that was one of the issues with the, the jaywalking in China thing. Um, it plastered that lady's face up on the, on the billboard, even though it was her face on a bus that was jaywalking. Um, because the system was entirely reliant on data and made decisions based entirely on that. Um, you need a human touch to this stuff. Um, so don't don't rely, if your model says this has a causal effect, don't immediately say, well, then let's roll it out. Think about the implications of that. Think about kind of the external validity of it, but also like, is it worth it? Should Is this real? Should we intervene? Um, think about kind of those other issues rather than just seeing a number and going with it. Um, so that's the manipulation side of how to kind of be a good ethical um, data analyst.